All right, welcome to our November 17th uh, class for the Master Beef Producer class, uh, Forage Nutrition. So tonight's topic um, is a combination of uh, a lot of the topics that we've covered. You've probably seen some of this content, uh, probably in multiple places, but it's one of those that I think you really need to just hammer home because over everything that we cover, this combines two of the biggest uh, cost expenses and determining factors of the quality of our operation, forage and nutrition. Uh, it's certainly not the only two, but these both play a huge role. When you combine them, this is the basis for um, the cow-calf operation. So we want to spend some time going back over it, hitting over some of the, the, the main points. And when I look at this picture, you know, we can kind of go the UT speak and say, you know, it's you know, look at the numbers, look, you know, drill down into the numbers and make sure you do it exactly as we're saying. Um, and, and certainly that's, uh, it's hopeful that we can do some of those things, but also big picture wise, you know, let's look at the big picture of what we're trying to accomplish. And if we can get a few take home factors to walk away from this, at least understanding a general concept, uh, I think we can um, really be, really help out. Um, our operation. So we're going to look at it from a big picture. I'm going to dive down in some numbers. We're not going to get caught up in the numbers. We're going to get caught up in the, the theory of what they're trying to tell us. So um, please feel free to participate as you go along. Uh, if you've seen this, uh, Dr. Jason Smith uh, talked a lot about some of these things here, but we think it's worth hitting home and maybe looking at it from a, from a little bit larger perspective. So we'll go through here. Do not hesitate. If you have questions, put them in chat. I'll try to get to them as we go or unmute yourself. So when we start looking at nutrition, um, you know, what we have to look at it is, you know, we, we talk about it being an asset. We talk about it being of value. A lot of times you start looking at, um, you know, calves on the ground, weaning weight of the calves, you know, animals, their, their herd health. Um, but what we don't think about is, a lot of the things that contribute to calves on the ground, reproducing a calf, the health is all based on the nutrition that the animal or the cow or the calf and or both are receiving. And so sometimes the health issues that arise are because that there are certain nutrients not being met in the animal's diet, which makes them susceptible to different health issues. You know, why they're not cycling and producing a calf near as frequently is because maybe they're not going in the right body condition. So, so it, it always tracks back to nutrition in some aspect. So um, when looking at it, we have to identify ways that we can maximize um, our nutritional assets as well as our animals. Um, when you look at it, you know, nutrition can make or break you. You know, you, you can put uh, every dollar of your operation in nutrition and actually be hurting. You can be overfeeding to a degree that it's detrimental to cattle. Um, you can put minimize and not put any dollars into nutrition and be detrimental to your operation. So optimizing um, your input because lots of dollars um, can be lost on nutrition. Um, it's one of the most expensive things that we have when running a cattle operation. So we wanna maximize the potential of the animal uh, while trying to minimize the cost as best as possible but we have to be, be aware of it. So when we break it down, um, which you learned back in, and I don't know, today it's probably kindergarten, but maybe it was third grade. Uh, what, are key what are the key things that we have to have for survival? Water, energy, protein, minerals, and vitamins. And if I put these in order, as far as um, our importance, we probably put protein first, second, third, fourth, and maybe we'll put uh, water in fifth. So uh, we're just kind of conditioned um, as humans, uh, not only for our own bodies, but also for our animals to think protein, protein, protein. Uh, and as we go throughout the night, we're gonna talk a little bit about this. You've probably, some of you have probably heard this. I speak a lot on this because I think it's just that important um, that there's, there's a few other limiting factors that might come up prior to protein. Doesn't mean that we can't, um, that we can miss any one of these one nutrients. We have to have them all. We have to have them all in the right balance, uh, but some play a larger role, a bigger limiting factor than others. So we'll talk about each one of those as we go along. So everybody's familiar with this. This is the basis of all cow-calf nutrition in Tennessee, the round bale. Obviously we offset it with a little protein supplements along the way and our vitamins and minerals that we have 
they all work in conjunction. Uh, you know, that, that one hay bale can offset either what's on the left with the protein or what's on the right with the vitamins and the minerals. If you put up the right quality hay with the, um, the right grasses, um, it's going to contain a lot of the protein that we need. It's also going to contain a lot of the vitamins and minerals. It doesn't mean necessarily that it contains everything that we need at all times throughout the year, but a high quality bale of hay can often meet a lot of our needs uh, for uh, most of these things. You may, you may have to do a little bit um, more vitamins and minerals at certain times of the year or feeding a balanced one, which is preferred throughout the year. Um, but you don't know that until you know what you have in your hay. Uh, some of our um, tests that we've done on these areas in Middle Tennessee have showed some limiting factors. Obviously, we're, we could be high in sulfur. We are high in phosphorus. And so it's to beware if, if you have a high sulfur, um, sometimes it can bind up other uh, minerals like magnesium and cause different uh, toxicities that we may have along the way. So um, knowing what you have in your hay can plays a role in all other aspects of our nutritional battle. So um, forages obviously are, are, are the, the, the biggest key that we have to have. Um, and then we talk about once you know what you have in your forages, then you need to know what you can supplement or what you need to add along the way. Um, you know, they go back and forth on, you know, free choice mineral. I know for many, many years of when we would feed our minerals, what type of minerals will we feed? Was, are we feeding salt? What are we feeding along the way? Um, and many nutritionists along the way um, to this point now all across the country uh, have settled on that there probably needs to be a very balanced year round supplement that's meeting their needs rather than trying to load at certain points throughout the year. Um, a high mag mineral in, in the early spring being an example is that feeding a consistent source of magnesium throughout the year uh, is probably a better uh, option than trying to just feed a high mag mineral once a year to be able to offset um, something gra like, like grass tetany. So um, we won't hit on that as much. That's a little bit more in the nutrition, but we're going to just, you know, but those are important factors that we play along the way. So Obviously, if you don't get the right forage, you're going to sacrifice performance. And once again, this all goes back down to uh, the analysis. And, you know, I, I hate to always just beat everybody across the head with the bat, the forage bat. I feel like at UT, we beat you across the head with it. It's not because we don't think it's um, it's necessary. We do think it's necessary. But, you know, some point, you know, you just kind of have to say, you know, this is the, the information and um, you can do with it what you want to. But I think it's important to maybe understand the concepts. So a forage test can can take you to the to the bullseye. But you know, if we just want to get near the dartboard, I think that's important too. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, you guys have seen this a million times, and I'm going to keep hitting home with this. Um, it's just that important to understand the the concepts of of the grass. So when you look at point z at the the left hand side you know and you don't have to see all the numbers that are going on there just know that on the very left hand side uh grass is in the green one and it is starting below the percentage of grass in your field at this point in time is below the weeds and you've not done anything to the pasture you're just letting it lay there clover is down very little you have more weeds than you have grass if the only thing you do uh, the next step, the only thing you do is you add phosphorus and potassium to the right levels. Your grass, you notice, that shoots up. The green line shoots up and the red line goes down. Your clover also increases a little bit, which is the blue line. That's just adding the right nutrients. That's So that's getting the right nutrients for the grass, which in, the, in turn allows the grass to thrive, providing competition for the weeds. Now, when you add the lime, that doesn't necessarily cause the grass to take off, but what it does is it, it provides a less desirable environment for the weeds. So the grass can, can kind of level off, providing a good set of competition. The clover comes on and helps provide a little competition for the weeds, but that competition in a better environment de further decreases the weeds. Then when you add that, that last input, which is, nitrogen. So you've added phosphorus, potassium, lime, and now nitrogen. You've really given that grass a boost. It can really take off and provide 
further competition. Now it will take off some of your clover. You'll see the blue line also go down, but the red line also deteriorates. And so what you've done is you provided a lot of competition. Weeds do not like competition. They thrive when it is hot and the grass is not hot, doing as well. When it's um, a drought, um, they like to thrive. But when, it, when it, the environment is correct and you have a good stand of grass, weeds do not do well. So the whole concept of it is try to keep a thick a stand of grass as you can, manage it that way. But since that's part of our um, overall strategy for managing our forage nutrition, that is the other aspect of it. So we're trying to manage a thick stand. So obviously fescue, we've talked about this, fescue toxicosis is, is, is real. Um, you know, we don't necessarily see it. We're not thinking about it all the time, but it's very real. You'll, you'll see, I looked at it today with a bunch of sheep. We were comparing sheep um, from one field on the top of the hill uh, to a, a pasture that was down below. Twins, one was a ewe uh, and one was a ram. Uh, there was 40 pounds difference when they both went to um, processing. 40 pounds difference between the two. One was at the top field, one was at the bottom field. Um, and it was purely because the top field had been renovated with clovers. The bottom field had just been acquired and had not been renovated with clovers. And so they were did most of their grazing during the summer and the, uh, the early fall. And so that's where they put on their weight. Everything else was identical and 40 pound difference between lambs. That's a huge difference. And so that can be purely attributed to the fact that you have a diluting factor with clovers. The clovers, um, let's say you, you've got some cattle going two pounds a day during the spring or in summer, they're gonna be coming back down to a pound per day. If you can just add a few clovers, that brings you up a half a pound. So that gives you a half a pound per day advantage to you. So, you know, those are things we're talking about forage nutrition. It can add. And so sometimes when we talk about nutrition, it's not just about gains, it's preventing losses. And this is one of those that prevents a loss. So it's just hitting home on this because this is part of our entire forage nutrition package. So I won't get too much into to this aspect because you guys have seen this a lot. It's a, it's a nice little, um, Let's see here. So, oops. So it's a nice little graph of a good way to manage acreage if you have the ability to set up some rotational paddocks to manage some acreage to maximize year-round production. And so that's why I'm trying to set up a fourth-year uh, pasture with Bermuda grass and a wheat overseed. Oops. There we go. Um, and trying to utilize your pastures all year long and trying to remove the stress points. So the stress points for fescue is during the summer. The stress points for Bermuda would be during the spring and the fall. So you can um, maximize your fields all around by utilizing this strategy. So I'm going to give my uh, UT verbatim speak on, on uh, doing the forage analysis. I don't say it just for the because UT pays me to say it or that we get a kickback from UT um, as far as forage analysis based on the number of analysis we do. It's not yet part of our uh, performance appraisal, maybe one day, but right now it's not yet part of our performance appraisal. Um, but it's one of those that we just keep saying because it's all about knowing what starts. Um, you know, if you've been to a doctor recently, if you had a health problem, uh, you know, they didn't come in there and probably just look at you and determine uh, what the next steps were as far as solving what the problem was. No, what they did was they, they probably ordered a series of tests because they needed to know what was going on inside your body. They could look at you and get a fairly good idea, but they needed to know exactly what was going on. And so they didn't just randomly start treating you and throwing things at you uh, to treat whatever they thought it might be. They wanted to know exactly what the issue was. So they had a good basis to start with. So if you apply that to, you know, what you would normally do and you would never accept your doctor just randomly throwing things at you, you, you want them to know what they're doing. So apply that to your cattle and your, your forage analysis. Um, you just don't, you can't know what your hay has going on without doing the analysis. You just don't know what's going on inside. You can have a pretty good thought and a pretty good feeling about it, but you don't have a good idea 
what it is. So that's where the forage analysis comes in. It gives you a starting point. Do you have to then come up with a very intricate uh, diet based on this? Absolutely not. You just need to know if, uh, if I was just gonna feed this, I might be short, I might provide it all that I need with this forage, but you just need a starting point. And so that's kind of what it's gonna look like. Um, you can send me a copy as well and we can walk through that. Um, but it, it starts to tell us the different stories about it about what's going on. Um, two of the things that I really like to see um, are in here are called the NDF and ADF. The ADF is basically, can they digest it? And so there's certain haze that no matter, you know, what they eat, no matter how much they eat, they can't digest it. Straw will be a good one. Sometimes, you know, there's no matter, you can't create a diet where they can digest enough to get the nutrients. The other aspect is what we call neutral detergent fighter, which is NDF. You don't have to know the numbers, but um, I can help you out with it. But ultimately, it, it just has to tell you physically, can they eat it? There's a lot of haze out there, and poor fescue hay is one of the one of the top culprits that um, they just cannot physically eat enough of a hay to ever get the nutrients they need. Um, it fills up in their gut before they get all the nutrients. So they just can't physically eat enough. And, and don't be mistaken, there's a lot of poor fescue hay that falls in these categories that they cannot physically eat enough to meet their nutrient requirements, even the most basic nutrient requirements. So there's times where we've done some analysis where straw hay had a better nutrient return than um, some of the fescue hay. So just because it's fescue doesn't mean it's a perfect. Now, it can, they can be a very high quality hay, but a poor hay is a poor hay is a poor hay. Um, and so you can't feed enough of them. So that's why it's important to know. If you've got a poor hay, sometimes you can work around it. You just need to know, okay, I need to be able to supplement X, Y, Z with it. Um, and it's just not gonna stand alone. So at the very least, analysis can tell us, hey, you're gonna have to do something else to it or don't buy that hay. If you got opportunity to spend $40 on two different bales of hay, one's good and one's not, um, why not spend $40 on the good hay? So be, be aware of it. For 20 bucks, if you're buying a huge load of hay, it's well worth 20 bucks to be able to figure out um, what this is. Like I said, you don't have to do anything to say with the numbers, just knowing is half the battle. Um, but what it will tell us is the dry matter. Typically, we like to see that to be 90. Uh, a good number that I think is easy for people to work with is the RFQ relative forage quality. And that just, that's a very, they, based on all the rest of these numbers, they try to score this hay. Um, and so it's not a perfect number, but it's a good number to give you a relative value. So, you know, if it's within that range, you're probably got a decent bale of hay. If it's below, be very cautious about buying it, knowing that you are going to have to supplement quite a bit to use that hay. Uh, it's sometimes it's way above. It may be more than what you need. And so the cost may be prohibitive uh, or it may run through it. It may be very heavy on pr crude protein. So this one has... Oh, so this one has, uh, you know, 14 and a half percent crude protein. And so that's pretty high. So more than likely that's probably got a clover or, or something in there. We have seen some grass grasses get that high, but with our typical fescue hay, it's probably a little high. Notice that we have 72% dry matter. Um, that is uh, probably indication that we have some type of haylage or baleage going on with this. Um, we won't spend too much time. One of the big units of uh, measurement for energy that we use uh, is total digestible nutrients or and or net energy of maintenance. So uh, one that's a little bit easier to use and, and follow is the TDN, uh, it's, which is the number we like to see in the 60s and above. The, the higher, the better for that one. Um, more specifically, the more accurate one is the net energy of maintenance. It's a little bit more um, uh, difficult to produce because you're not necessarily going to see these numbers on feed tags, but that's what we're here for. We can help you at any point in time. You can call, text, or, or send uh, send your analysis here, and we can just talk about it, or we can come out and visit about it, but it's just nice to know. It's, when it's like going to your doctor. You get the test so that you know, and they can make the best recommendation based on that, not a guess. So um, 
you know, as we look here, like I said, I'm not going to, we're going to show some numbers here. We're not going to, it's not all about reading what the numbers are. It's what the story that they're telling. So here, you know, we just talk about the TDM, which once again, that's the way they measure energy. We measure energy also by net energy of gain. So um, it's just showing that if you have trying to gain one pound per day with a 700 pound animal, you're, it's going to take nine pounds of the TDN. If you're going to get two pounds, you have to feed a little bit more of it, three pounds, a little bit more of it. So it depends on how much is actually in each one of those. So you can see the difference between a thousand pound cow and a 700 pound cow and what they're actually going to need. Okay, so right here is we've got three different forages and we're going to talk about these three forages. So I need you, every one of you guys to memorize what you see on this screen in the next five seconds so that you have a photographic memory. Uh, but we're going to talk about all three of these and use them in a, as examples as we walk through uh, trying to describe what scenario you might see. And so trying to give you the big picture view so that you can take to your operation and get the best start. So forage A is going to be the bad one. Okay. I, I hope everybody saw that right off the bat. We talked about 60 being a good number to start with for TDN. So uh, forage A obviously is going to be a little bit uh, deficient there. It's going to be a little bit low and net energy of maintenance. So net energy of maintenance is everything is the energy it requires for that animal just to operate its own body on a daily basis, not do anything else, just operate its own body uh, and exist, breathe, a walk if it has to, that's it. Um, the NEG, net energy of gain, is what it takes for animals to actually gain um, weight above the baseline, which is net, net energy of maintenance. So they have to have X number to be able to, to just maintain themselves. And then anything above that is what we call gain, so net energy of gain. So it is the lowest out of all three of those. And then crude protein is 8.2, which is not too bad. That's that's probably a pretty typical, uh, maybe slightly lower on the crude protein for a for like a tall fescue for some of our grasses. So really not that out of line. Uh, forage B, that's probably more of a, just a good average forage. We're looking at 60% uh, TDM, which is our energy. Uh, the net energy and maintenance and gain both fall right in line. And crude protein is probably you know right where we would want it. Uh, C, that's pretty high uh, TDN, which is really good for us to have, a little bit higher in net energy, maintenance, and gain. And our crude protein is would be would be elevated for a grass forage. So that's a pretty high quality forage that we have. So we just talked about each one of these. Um, so, you know, we, we, we broke each one of them down. Uh, and then crude protein, obviously, is what we talk about when we talk about pr protein. It's fed in the form of called crude protein. This is what we need for the growing animals, you know, especially you see some of the young calves, uh, first calf heifers. All right. So if you've been to the grocery store and you've been to a steakhouse, which is more expensive? The steak or the salad? The steak or the corn? Okay, which is more expensive, the steak or the candy bar? Um, obviously, uh, if anybody's purchased one of those, they know that the steak is higher every time. Uh, it's higher to feed our cells protein, and it's much higher to feed uh, animals protein. Um, but what we're conditioned from, from the very beginning for ourselves and for animals is that protein is the number one factor. So what's the first factor you look at when you look at a feed tag? Or what's the first marketing factor that you see on a feed tag uh, or the feed bag on the front? It has X number of per, you know, percentage of protein. That's the first thing we can are conditioned to look at. But, um, you know, the story that we need to take away from tonight is that the second thing you need to be looking at is protein. The number one thing you need to be looking at is energy, 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 energy. Uh, energy drives everything we do. And what we'll break, we'll go into a little bit further depth on that, but energy drives everything we do. You can't um, utilize a protein without um, first meeting your energy needs. So we'll kind of go through that, but that's the entire basis of tonight is to know that. Um, 
That doesn't mean that there's not a time and place for all the energy or protein strategies that are utilized. There absolutely is um, a time and place for each one of them, but it's being aware of what those are so that you can properly utilize them. Um, but we're going to break that down and walk through it, but that's what you're going to try to get into. We're not going to get into the nuts and bolts of it, but we want to see the big level picture and how we can use it at the, um, at the, you know, 30,000 foot view. So, oops. So here, you know, this is where we talked about, um, forage a not having a, um, you know, being a very good content. And so if you look at it, it's, you know, this left-hand side, you don't have to look at the numbers. It, that's just how much can they intake per day, okay? And then the other one is the energy content. And so if you'll see it, it's going down, okay? What this, the whole picture says here is they can't eat enough. And when we talked about NDF, uh, which is neutral detergent fiber, if we would have looked in analysis of that forage, we would see a high NDF. And what that means is they just couldn't physically eat enough to be able to um, get the enough energy to be able to maintain their body. Um, it would just, they'd eat and it'd just fill their gut up and then they would stop. They get that, those sensors would turn on and say, hey, you've had enough, stop eating. And you'd stop and you still wouldn't have the nutrients you'd have. So they may have a full gut, but they may actually be losing weight in lots of other places. So, uh, you know, you got to be very aware of what you're doing. And so you may look at, look out across your herd and see some, um, you know, large gutted animals and, and still miss the story that they're not getting the nutrients they have and their body condition score may actually be going down because they're just, they've got gut fill. They don't, but it's not being utilized along the way. So, you know, this one's the same thing, same thing. So, you know, as they're on the left-hand side, the dry matter intake as a percentage of their body weight. So as they take it, um, as they eat more, they're going to have more uh, net energy of uh, maintenance. So as it goes up, you know, they need to eat more of it. So there, there is A. So you can see, let me add all three of these. So at A, at one and a half percent, they can't, eat, they can only get about four, and a, you know, 0.45, which is less than the amount of uh, net energy or energy that they need. They physically cannot get enough to have that gain to, to maintain with A. You know, B is right about right where they need to be and C is kind of off the chart. So here, here we start looking at this is trying to grow cattle at any daily or average daily gain. Um, so when you're looking at this chart, the the dotted line, the yellow dotted line, um, is is the baseline. That is what an average animal would need, as far as energy comes. If you look at the blue line, it is below that. They cannot get, no matter what, they cannot get enough. Uh, the orange line is. Most of the time it's providing enough. Um, and the gray line is number or is forage C and it's providing a lot more than they could ever need. So here's a good example. So we're trying to gain one pound per day. If you tried to gain one pound per day, forage A would meet their requirements. Okay, from five for 500 to a thousand pound animal, one pound per day is going to be able to be be made with the 4J. But if you think about one pound per day, so you take a, a year old calf, let's say they weigh, you know, uh, 800 pounds, you know, it'll be a little bit light, let's say a thousand pounds, you know, they'd only weigh 1,365 pounds a year later. You know, that's, that's pretty slim gains. And so if you look at um, 4J B, obviously, they're going to gain much quicker. They're going to be able to have much uh, better chance to be able to, to go. It's going to far surpass their needs for a gain. And, and forage C obviously is skyrocketing above. That's just at one pound per day. You go at 1.4, all of a sudden, it's barely meeting the needs at 1.4 pounds. Remember, we're trying to shoot for two and above. That's where we're trying to shoot for as far as gaining for our, uh, especially for our stalker animals. 
you start getting to 1.8 pounds, all of a sudden there's nothing forage A can do. So if you're trying to graze your stalker animals out on um, some wheat uh, and trying to put on, you know, you try to do a little weaning program, 45 day weaning program, you are not going to be able to meet 1.8 pounds per day, which is where you have to be to be able to make any money off those animals with just grazing on that forage. Can't be done. Um, so you're already at a loss uh, with, those, with those animals. Uh, with forage B, you, you can surpass that. You, you can easily get your 1.8 pounds per day and forage C, you obviously can as well. So trying to get above two, this is where, you know, this is where you start making the difference in money is having a quality forage. Uh, obviously forage A is really falling behind. Forage B is starting to, um, is still, you know, staying pace. Remember forage B is just a, a basic quality forage, um, but we know what's going on there. And so all of this is not just net energy and maintenance. This is gaining. This is the, the, the nutrients they need, they need to actually gain uh, 2.1 pounds per day, not just maintain. So, uh, you know, that, that's kind of where we're at with the 2.1. So now looking at crude protein, um, well, obviously when we talk about crude protein, where is it important? We just talked about that a little bit ago. It's important for growing cattle. So for crude protein, um, at the 1,000 pound animal, they're gonna be deficient um, for forage A and B uh, nearly the entire time for crude protein, for growing cattle. Um, forage C, uh, they're only deficient for a very short period of that growing period. After that, they're getting all they need. But for a growing animal, obviously they're gonna need a little bit more crude protein because they have lots of systems that are still developing. Um, now, the full grown animal tells a little bit different story. So here's cows um, on energy. So this is important to, to look at. You don't have to, to follow all this, um, all the different colors along the way. But no, during um, the first two months of lactation, almost the first three months, um, they're going to need, well, the entire year, they're going to need about the same amount of energy for maintenance. So they're going to need about the same amount of forage energy that they're getting to maintain their body throughout the year. This is basically, this is just living. This is not doing anything else other than the fact that they have to breathe and they have to physically eat and walk. Um, now we start to add in, let's say that you've got a growing animal. And so, you know, our cows aren't growing as much, but your heifers, you might be growing a little bit more. So you're going to have that orange bar. This is for cows, but they have a little bit of a growth period that they're going to have to be um, adding in there. So you have a little bit for that. But then where you see the big difference is the gray bar, which you don't have to, it doesn't matter about the amount or the numbers, but no, during the first two to three months of lactation, they have a tremendous need for energy. A tremendous need for energy. And so when you look at it at the top, you know, that little blue line that's kind of that little squiggly line that's going along the way, during the first two months of lactation, that is their highest peak of energy when you combine all the things between lactation and then eventually uh, after month three, they're going to start to be pregnant, hopefully. And so we start to build our need for energy for pregnancy. But during the first two months, that is their highest peak for energy. Their lowest peak is month seven. Their lactation is almost completely tailed off. And that is when they first are starting to grow that calf in their belly. So, you know, they're maintaining, um, they have a little bit of growth and they're just now starting to divert nutrients to pregnancy, but that's their lowest point in time. And then it starts to grow back up as that calf starts to develop and they start to, to develop resources towards that calf. So key, obviously, if we, know, if we know that the first two months of lactation are the most important, that is when we need to focus most of our time is making sure that those animals have that um, highest amount of energy during that time. The lowest point is about month seven from calving. Month seven from calving, that's um, kind of the beginning, during the second period of gestation as we start to move into uh, the calving process. So be thinking about that, whether you've got um, 
year-round calving or whether you've got um, seasonal calving, you, you still probably have, even if you have your year-round calving, you still probably have general periods when those calves are calving. So back that off to try to figure out when are those first two months of gestation. That's when you need to be meeting those needs. Um, but you also need to know when they don't need anything um, because you know if you're putting money into them that doesn't need to be spent in month seven, then that's money lost. So we'll go along here. Um, so we look at the protein, okay? So look at protein. Protein is obviously highest again, uh, second month of lactation. They're, they're making a lot of milk. Milk has got protein. Those calves are really starting to really drink a lot of milk. That's the heaviest point of lactation. After that, it starts to go down. It follows a very similar curve uh, as, as the energy does. After month two, it starts to go down to month seven, and then we start to build back up as that calf is growing. But as far as maintenance, they need a very, very low amount of energy just to maintain, or protein just to maintain. They're done growing for the most part, so they don't need a whole lot for themselves. Lactation is the, is the biggest key. Pregnancy is, is the second along the way. So, But it follows a very similar curve. Um, let me see if we can come along here. One of the things that um, I want to kind of hit on real quick is um, animals have to meet their energy needs. We, we're going to keep saying that time and time again. So let's say that you're feeding um, a protein tub, which have some which have some great applications um, if you use them the right way. But it's very high in protein. Uh, probably very low, maybe in energy, depending on which type of tub you're feeding. So if the animal is deficient in energy, but getting high amounts of protein, um, energy comes from a carbon in it. Okay, we don't, we don't have to get too far into the science, but uh, protein is made up of carbon and nitrogen. Well, if you need energy first, the first thing the animal does is it goes, okay, we're going to have to get rid of uh, the nitrogen because we have to have energy first, which is the carbon. So that actually you start, they pee out all the nitrogen in order to use the energy. So basically you're fed really, really expensive protein that the animal is turn around and, turning around and converting into energy to, to meet their energy needs first. So they have to actually have the energy to be able to convert that protein into something they can use. So if you don't, they're just going to turn the protein into energy. And so you've just fed a really expensive source. So if you're feeding a bunch of soybean meal uh, instead of corn, they're first going to turn that soybean meal into corn, which is four times as high as the corn. And then uh, your pocketbook's really going to get hit. So, um, you know, I don't just say it just to be saying it. I say it because it makes a huge difference in your pocketbook. If you're not meeting their energy needs and you're feeding extra protein, they're going to turn that protein into energy and you just paid the, the heavy freight of, uh, of the cost. So it's important from the pocketbook side to know that. So here's the, here's the interesting thing around it. So we look at forage A. This is why you, you know, it continues to know uh, if you can know exactly what's going on, but if not, having a pretty good idea of, of timing. So forage A. If you, you don't have to know exactly the numbers, just know that there's a line going across. That is what the animal has to have uh, to maintain itself. That blue line follows the, the animal from day one of calving uh, until day one of, of the next calf. And so we talk about energy status. So forage A, only at one point in time of that animal's life during that year, is it providing enough energy for that animal? Remember, it is a very low quality energy, but it had a real, it had a decent um, uh, crude protein. It had average crude protein for what we call a fescue hay, uh, probably, and it had very low energy. That's why that that that's why that um, thing would score pretty low because it has very low energy. So when you look at it, it is only at one point in time is it above the required energy that animal needs. For one month out of 12, does, can you only feed that hay bale to your animal? And forage A is probably a pretty good representation of, of quite a bit of hay. 
Now, if you move over to the protein status, once again, the, the solid line going across the middle is what they need. If you look at it from month six to month 11, so roughly five months out of the year, it provides enough protein for that animal. So one month, for, does it meet the energy needs, which is the number one need? And only in five months, it meets the need on protein. Okay, so if I looked at this thing, we'll, we'll, we'll dive into it here in a second. This is what we could do. Like I said, it doesn't mean that you, could, you have to throw away forage A. It just means you have to know it, that it doesn't have enough, so you have to supplement. And so up top, there's a couple of good examples of, of ways that you could supplement along the way. Um, there, you know, there's varieties of ways, but here is an example just knowing that it's going to be deficient for, um, you know, seven months of the year. Where can I feed it? It's deficient uh, for protein. It's deficient for energy. Uh, 11 months of the year, this is what I need to do. Okay, we'll go to forage B. Remember, this is a this is a pretty average forage. This is you know it's a good quality one, but but it's average, uh, sixty percent uh, TDN, which which is a pretty average. Hey, nine point eight is is fairly average for the fescue hay as far as crude protein. If you look at the energy status, there is only about three months, maybe four, that 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 hay does not provide enough energy for that animal uh, in its year life, okay? And that's just during the four months of heavy lactation. During those four months of heavy lactation, you need to supplement just a little bit extra energy for that animal to be able to meet its needs. The rest of the time, that hay does all it needs to do. You don't need to feed that animal anything else uh, throughout the year. If you did, you're wasting your money because that animal doesn't need those extra nutrients. It's able to maintain and get its body weight to where it needs to go by just consuming that forage. Look at protein. There's only about two months that it's below status. So the same thing, and it skyrockets above protein, a lot more than what it needs for protein status. Um, but once again, only about two months uh, or three months that it actually needs supplemental protein. You know, and here's some good examples where you could supplement some of these things to be able to meet the needs. Forage C, that's that high quality forage, 70% um, TDN, and it's got a little bit higher crude protein. Look at it, crude protein skyrocketing. We don't even worry about protein uh, with these animals. Uh, we look at energy, don't even worry about it. Skyrocket, way above. You get hay like that, there's not much supplementation that you need to do. It pretty much meets the, the need. Now, base, remember, this is based on a, a cow. Um, you start bringing in heifers and that some things that are not only trying to grow themselves, they're trying to grow a heifer, they're trying to rebreed, especially if you get into first calf heifers, they're trying to rebreed, grow, lactate, and um, grow themselves, maintain. So there's lots of things going on. They might need a little bit more, but for your average cow, forage C and forage B pretty much meet the needs the entire time. So know when it's low, know when you don't need to be feeding anything extra. More importantly, know when you don't need to be feeding any, anything extra. Sometimes um, we have them like, we have them like, um, we sometimes feed our horses. We look out there and we know that they um, they like the hay or they like the the grain that we feed them out there. So it makes us feel good. Uh, and there's there's certain reasons why you know sometimes working cattle get them getting them used to it. You know we use a little grain to do that, and that's certainly not going to um, hurt anything. You know we have a purpose for that. But just throwing the feed out there, just to throw the feed out there, uh, there's no return uh, if you're feeding forage C. And if you're feeding forage B. Um, there's no return if you're feeding it when they're uh, in month seven. So just know when you're throwing it out there what you're getting for it. So this is um, how we prioritize animals uh, as far as their bodies. So if we give them a certain amount of energy, the first thing they're going to do is maintain. Once they're able to maintain, they're going to try to grow their body. So animals by default have to take care of themselves. You can't, you know, what's the first thing when, um, 
they talk, if you're a parent on a, uh, an airplane and the plane's going down, put your life, put your uh, life jacket on first, then put your child. So that's the same thing here. You can't save the baby. You can't raise the baby until you take care of yourself. And so they first have to maintain, then they have to grow. If they have enough left uh, of that feed for lactation, yes. they'll do that. And then the final thing, they will try to, um, maintain a pregnancy. The law, the last thing that's done in some things where, where I think a lot of us, or a lot of times you start to lose, um, a calf, maybe over five year period is the time it takes them to cycle back. Um, you know, energy is, is the key to that. And so they, the animal has to have enough energy. So that's why we take our, our cows into calving and lactation that first month. You like to take them in uh, at a six. And so if they come back down, their body condition comes back down to a four, then, then we're able to utilize them and get them to rebreed. But a lot of times they may come into a five uh, into the cat or into the calving season. And then you pull them down into a low four or even three. And so then when they come back to um, actually cycle again for pregnancy, you know, instead of doing it within the first 60 days, then they may do it in the first uh, 80 to 90 days. And so maybe you missed a month or two that you didn't notice. Um, but over a period of five years, if you keep adding a couple months to it uh, over five years, you've pretty soon you've lost an entire year and, and lost an entire calf. Um, just by missing the cycle because she wasn't at the right body condition as we go through. Because remember, that's the last thing she's going to try to do is worry about cycling again. So first thing she has to take all that one morsel of, of hay that she eats, she's going to take it and allocate it like this from maintenance to growth, lactation, pregnancy, and then to a, a new pregnancy. So the, that's the last thing she cares about is a new pregnancy. So um you know, but that's the first thing that we care about. Get that first calf on the ground, take care of her, and then get her rebred. Um, and so what we're looking at, so that's what we kind of start looking at it. When you don't meet the requirements, these are the things you start to, to, uh, to sacrifice. Um, you know, growth, performance, longevity, health, well-being, carcass quality. Those are all nutritional factors that, that play a role in it. And so that's, you know, direct things on the cattle. But some things you start to see on the the offspring, and so I think um, we'll get into that second. I want to make sure I've got a question. It looks like here. Um, what is the best feed from for one to four months uh, period? Uh, that's once again. That's gonna, uh, Danny. That's gonna depend on what you're feeding to start with. Um, you kind of have to know what you, what what forage you have to know what you need to have, and there's. Uh, you know, some complete feeds that have, you may be completely set with protein and all you need is a good energy source for your animal. Um, more than likely, most, most of our haze, you're going to be deficient in protein and energy during that first one to two months of lactation. So you're going to want to feed probably, you know, somewhere in the 14% crude protein will probably get, come close to getting it done. But it's something certainly I wouldn't just f start firing away. It's the same as um, we start start talking about soil analysis. Um, if you're going to go out and just buy a bunch of potassium and phosphorus and uh, and nitrogen and, and lime and just throw it on your pastures without testing, there's a good chance you've just thrown a whole bunch of money away. Um, maybe you get some return from it. Maybe you don't. Maybe you get part of the return for it, but you know it costs you you know, four times as much as it should have um, because you didn't test it. So I, I would I would never recommend putting a bunch of nutrients on without testing. And that's the same thing. I wouldn't go buy a bunch of feed just without knowing exactly what I want. But if you ask me for general, because I think that's important to know, is if you just generally know that um, I've got some cows that they're in one to two months of lactation, I know that I that my forage is probably not meeting its needs, then you want to follow, you know, go find a good complete feed. It's probably got 14% crude protein. It's got somewhere in the, in the mid sixties on the TDN. And so you may have to ask them what the TDN is uh, for some of these, cause they don't always put it on the, the feed tag. Um, but in general, like I said, if you can't test it, 
just know in general that one to two months that you probably need to be supplementing them something if you don't, if you just assume that you have a average quality bale of hay. I hope that helped a little bit there, but if it didn't, um, I'm happy to clarify. So Dana, let me know. Um, so we're, we're going to come back here, look at 4J. So look at gestation, um, which is the time when that we're, we're trying to rebreed them um, right at two months we're, of lactation. We're going to start trying to get them bred. And so that's when the energy status, they, 4J only has that one period of time that they're going to be uh, meeting the nutrients. And so once again, same thing goes uh, for protein. Um, it's going to have a few extra months during the uh, gestation period or when they're trying to um, grow the calf in them during that time. So uh, it's where it's showing it. So um, one of the things that, that we try to talk a little bit about that always comes up during forage nutrition is people try to talk about forage or uh, nutrition manipulation with calves. Um, it's either trying to grow them <laughs> too much um, or more than likely almost trying to shrink the size of, of the calf through forage nutrition. Um, so um, what we're trying to look through is trying to figure out, you know, what, what is the, uh, the true basis of it? What can we actually do when the, the calf is in utero? Um, is there anything that we can do? Uh, that he can cause either um, positive or negative effects. And so we'll, we'll try to look into, into each one of those. Um, but the important part is, is, you know, we always hear, is it environmental or genetic effects? Um, and oftentimes, you know, it's looked at, and I know some of them look at it, you, there may be different opinions on it, but that, a calf is probably genetically predisposed to be a certain weight. Um, as long as everything is um, in harmony, in uniformity, as in they're getting that cow is getting the right amount of nutrients, that calf is going to be predisposed to be a certain weight. You can't control what that is. If you do it, um, you're doing harm to that animal because you are causing an error in, in the programming. So basically, look at it as a computer. Um, it is, it is designed to, to function in a way and come up with a program. If you start manipulating it, you can, you'll cause an error more than likely trying to improve it. So um, they, they looked at starving, you know, you can look at that second bullet point, starving a developing calf will de decrease their birth weight slightly, um, but it's not going to decrease it enough to actually cause an, um, you know, a gain in the birth weight. Um, the biggest thing to take out of all of this is, is that you, if you def, um, deprive the calf of the required nutrients, those nutrients are there in the brain development, um, in, in the body development, the organ development. And so when you deprive those um, calves of those right nutrients, it's not selective saying, okay, we're going to deprive it of fat. And so the animal doesn't get too heavy. It's to plot, you know, and calves need fat too, because it's key to um, hormone and, brain and uh, organ development. But when you deprive those animals of those nutrients, uh, you're, you're shutting down that system. You're not really affecting the weight whatsoever, but you are tremendously affecting the way that calf um, develops. And so, you know, you, we, we brought up a, a sheet here and trying to give you a, an example of it. Um, when you try to meet or supplement an animal, and supplement means supplementing to the right degree, not too much, uh, not too little, um, there was no difference in birth weight when, versus supplementing and not supplementing. But there was a tremendous difference when you looked at the weaning weight versus the ones that were not supplementing. Uh, you had about a 20 pound difference between those two animals just by providing enough, the right nutrients to that first calf heifer uh, versus not providing any nutrients. Um, bigger thing when you looked at, so that was a calf performance, but once again, we, we, sometimes we forget about once we get that calf on the ground, we sometimes forget about the name of the game is getting that 
cow pregnant again, getting her ready to rock and roll to get that next one because like it doesn't take too long. You have a you have a cow for five years, uh, and if every year she misses it by two months, uh, after five years you've lost an entire calf. Now, you know if if you're a part time farmer and you know and time is of the essence. You might be able to say, I, ju you know, I can justify saying that because I just, I don't have the time to be able to, you know, meet all the needs of those. So I, I assume that I'm going to uh, have a certain amount of loss. But uh, if that doesn't work uh, as well for your um, pr production strategy, um, the, the name of the game is to get her pregnant again and get a calf on the ground. Um, even if it weighs less, get a calf on the ground. So, and have a calf every year. So when you look at the maternal performance, if you don't have her going in with the right amount of nutrients, her pregnancy rate is going to decrease. You know, more importantly, having that calves in the first 21 days. Remember those calves that, that come during the first part of our breeding season, uh, those cows are our best cows. Um, you know, they may not have the high, the best quality calf, but I guarantee you time over time, those cows that have uh, calves in that first 21 days are going to be your better cows. Um, they're going to have roughly the same amount of um, uh, calves being born the same weight, same unassisted. But that big difference between when those first calves are born and the pregnancy rate is huge uh, when we're starting to work through this. And so the same thing goes um, for the re maintenance requirements. Uh, not much is different as far as you just can't basically what this is saying is you can't change uh, the, the size of the calf based on what you are supplementing it. You can, but you can change the fetal programming. Um, and that's what a lot of this comes down to say is ultimately you need your calves coming in. You need your cows coming in at a body condition score six. Um, you know, upper end, because you don't want to waste money. You bring them in higher than that, then that's that's feeding them too hot. And so they've got, they're, they're, you have wasted nutrients that are being fed to them. Um, but if you bring them in body score six and assume that that's going to probably pull them down to a, to a low five uh, by the end of the uh, gestation period, the lactation period, then you're going to be able to get them rebred a lot quicker within hopefully those first two months. And so here, here's a good, you know, I think this is what we we're getting ready to talk to. You're going to be able to pull them in at a five and get them rebred within those first two months. That puts you on pace to have a calf every year. You get down here, you know, you say, okay, well, why don't we feed them to a body condition score seven? So uh, that means they went in at a eight um, and they came back down to a seven. Well, when you overfeed an animal, you, you have uh, uh, detrimental effects as well. Uh, obviously, you know, we see it on the human side, but you, you, it's not all just gain to say, okay, I can knock off a month by getting them at a body condition, condition score eight and taking them down to a seven and then rebreeding. Um, so what you have to look at is all the other effects, the cost of getting them to a, a, an eight, uh, what body effects do we have that, that are um, causing health problems? So ideally we come in at that five and six, that puts us on schedule to have a calf every year. You start pulling down into four, body condition score three. Three is a, you know, kind of a hard winner. Uh, we didn't get all the right nutrients. And you're talking about 90 days after, that's three months. Okay, so uh, in roughly three years, you've lost a calf. Uh, let's say, a lot of us have cows that are anywhere between seven and 10 years old. You've lost two calves. And so when you look at the stock market or when you look at the market and, and, and you know, have issues with where the market's at, uh, and there's certainly reason to have issues, um, you know, you have to then take that cost of two calves and spread it out over the, of the price of those calves that you just had. And you automatically raise the value of those animals. So uh, having a calf every year is the key. Uh, you know, we, we say this every year just to, just to keep on it. Cause it's just so important. You know, we've made so many strides in, in Tennessee with it. Um, but you still see, uh, hay sitting out, uh, the hay barn effect is the, the hay barns are still in effect. You can still get, be part of that program. Obviously, um, 
you know, cost of materials has changed a little bit, but just looking at the difference between feeding a dry bale of hay that's been kept under cover versus uh, under a tree line, 35% loss. Remember that number, 35% of that, that hay is gone in six months. We're probably more than likely feeding that hay 12 months later, um, but 35% uh, of that hay is gone just by sitting out there. So, um, you know, I, I can do the, the effect. Let's say you bought a bale of hay for $40. Um, it's probably not much different in the cost to actually um, produce it yourself. You know, taking 35% of that $40, you know, losing a third of it, it's, it's uh, that's pretty hard to deal with. So you, you can go ahead and take $13 off that, that bale of hay. Um, and so that's, you know, it starts to become a pretty big number. Uh, you know, when you just put a um, plastic wrap around it, you got 12%. So you're, you're still losing a good percentage of it. Six months uh, undercover, you don't lose any. So important thing to remember, you had 35% loss just by storing it outside. Now you go ahead and put that in a hay feeder and they're going to waste probably anywhere from 15 to 25% of that hay. Um, so let's just say it's low end, 15%. You had 35% plus 15. So you've lost 50% of that hay um, that you now don't get any return for. So you bought a bale of hay for $40 um, and it's really going to cost you $60. You know, you thought you got a good return for it. Or that's when you buy a bale of hay uh, for $35 or maybe even 50, but you found a better deal for $30, you could get one. Um, it turns out it was really low quality and it was kept outside. And so really that bale is um, really the equivalent of about three or, you know, three bales uh, of the nutrients you need to have to be able to match that one $50 bale of hay. So uh, it depends on the quality of the hay. So just because it's $30 or just because it's $50 doesn't mean that they're quality hay um, or poor quality hay. You just, you need to have an analysis done, but know when you're starting to do that, is if you buy a $30 bale of, or a $20 bale of, of really poor hay, you're probably getting exactly what you paid for and you're gonna have a lot of loss on that. So you're really not getting a lot of return. Um, so one of the good options that, that we've seen a lot of people start to do is doing the unrolling hay. Um, and so the whole key to this operation, we're not going to get into every detail about it, but the key to unrolling hay and, and why people, some people have gotten a little frustrated with it and didn't feel like they did as well eating of it is they have to be a little bit hungry. If they're not hungry, they'll eat a bit, a little bit, and then lay down in it. But if you, if you wait long enough that they've got just a little bit of a hunger in it, then they will um, usually clean it up pretty well and does a great job of spreading out any type of weeds you may have so you don't get those big concentrations and they actually do a little bit better job of eating. Uh, the other return is, especially during calving, if we get another really wet winter like we had, uh, it gives the calves an opportunity to lay uh, on some dry area away from the, that top picture where they get get trampled down and you, and you always lose a few calves uh, right around the hay ring. So that gives them an opportunity to, to uh, get away, stay dry, and you know maintain your, your calf crop. Um, a good a good figure to always work of. I mean, everybody always tries to figure out, you know, what it costs. Uh, obviously, feeding hay is the most expensive time of uh, the year for maintaining cattle, uh, but a good figure to use. Obviously, not every hay bale is created the same and not every cow is the same size, uh, but roughly uh, a bale of hay per, per month per cow uh, is a good way if you're starting to try to figure roughly what it costs you to uh, maintain cattle through the winter time, one bale of hay per month per cow. So you're talking about roughly four months maybe um, of animals. And if you're buying a $50 bale of hay, you've got $200 per animal. Obviously that, that adds up. So you wanna maximize that, that time. And so that's important to know, um, you know what, what, what you're actually feeding. So we'll, we'll kind of get into that a little bit, but. I think that whole story was obviously if you're um, that whole thing changes if you're feeding a low quality bale hay that's been stored outside and you feed it in the hay ring where they're able to get further wastage you're talking about more than one bale per month maybe you're getting into two bales and so you went from 200 you know you went from uh, let's say you bought a 30 dollar bale of hay 
uh, you went from $120 uh, to now needing uh, maybe $240. So um, your cost can go up quite a bit. And so as we kind of sum it up here, I wanted to make sure we leave um, time. And, and it's one of these that we don't necessarily need to spend all night on because I think it's we're trying to summarize uh, some topics that we've just talked about throughout the, the entire time, but the information is so important that we need to hit on it again, is just understanding that try to get a forage analysis, uh, knowing the quality uh, of your nutrients and what your cattle actually needs at that time, making sure you feed a, the right supplementation that goes along with that. Uh, once again, your forages will tell you too. You know, if you got a low quality forage, you may have to feed more of your minerals. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, and then to, it just plays a role in the, in the feed cost. So the, the ultimate end game is trying to feed the least amount of nutrients as possible while still maximizing the cow's value. And so by maximizing the cow's value means she is able to produce on time every time. And so if, if you start, you know, pulling nutrients back enough that she's not able to produce at her maximum uh, value, then, then you're losing overall, you know, cost and value in your animals. So you don't want to, you don't want to spend a dollar more than you have to, but you want to spend every dollar you have to, to be able to maximize her. Okay. And, um, I want to talk about at this very end, uh, the big picture thing. Um, so let's say you've got a year round uh, program. You know, we, we talk about it and you're just, you, know, you just don't feel comfortable like you really want to do a, a hay analysis and um, you just want to, you know, try to go with what you have. So let's talk about if, if you don't want to do any of the things that we talked about, but you, but you care and you're trying to figure out what's the best way to manage your program. You've got a full-time job. You're trying to do all that you can do. There's just only so much time in the day. What are some strategies that you can use to just change what you're doing without really having to change anything? One of them would be is if you have the ability to have a side load barn, is that can take advantage of um, quality of hay. So let's say that you know that most of your cows are going to breed or, or calve during the month of January. You know, you're year round calving, but let's say 75% of them are going to come between January and um, March or, or April. Just knowing that, know that roughly that they need to have that those animals are trying to lactate during those couple of months is that that's when you need to have your highest quality nutrients for those animals. So if I'm just going to blindly throw out um, some uh, supplements, I'm going to throw out a majority during that time because that's when a majority of my animals are going to need the most of their nutrients. I'm going to assume that they need probably a complete feed. They're going to need protein and energy during that time. I'm also going to assume that my first cutting hay, this is a big assumption. I'm going to assume that my first cutting hay was probably my highest quality. Not always true. You get a very late cutting first hay and it's all stems. That's not necessarily true, but just using our general logic, first cutting hay, Let's see here, hold on. First cutting hay is going to be your highest quality. So let's assume that we know everything is trying, or th three quarters of our cows are trying to calve during uh, January to April. I'm gonna save my first cutting hay for those animals that are trying to breed or, or calve during that time during the first two months of lactation because we know that's when they need the most nutrients that's when they need the energy so i'm going to try to do any of my supplementing during that time and i'm going to feed my highest quality hay uh, at that time um, let's say that that was january seven months from now so july is when i'm making sure that the lowest quality pasture uh, if I've got a lower quality pasture that is when those cows are not getting any supplement um, that, and that's when they're going to be on kind of just an average quality pasture. I don't want to take care of them. 
uh, any more than I have to, any more supplementing than I have to. And so that's when knowing if you have a side load barn, if you ever have the ability to access your hay from different cuttings, try to put your um, best quality hay uh, either at the back or the front so that you can access it at different points in time. That's where I the side load hay is you can, you can, or the side load barns, you can put your hay by cutting and know in general, you know, when is a better time to use a lower quality hay. In general, your third, your third cutting may be your lowest quality hay. And so that's when you wanna feed it during month seven. So if you've got a bunch of cows that are, uh, that are in middle of their gestation period in um, October, November, that's probably when they would get that lower quality hay. But if you really have the ability, you could forage test your, um, first cutting, your second cutting, and third cutting, and know exactly what kind they have, and then try to feed it based on when they need their highest quality nutrients. So um, forage analysis is the easiest and the best way to gauge it, gauge it but um, we can also just use logic and try to feed along the way. So um, if, if you take anything out of this presentation, just take that in general, know that the first um, four months when they need the most nutrients, uh, if you can figure out what your um, quality or analysis of your hay is, um, know that, that your hay may have the ability to meet all their needs for the entire time, or it may be able to meet their needs for 80% of the time, and you only have to supplement for 20, that extra 20% of the time. So know when, when that period of time is, know that energy is, uh, is more important than protein, and when we talk about meeting their needs first, protein plays in a very important role, especially in growing cattle, but look at their energy needs first. Those two can help maximize our cattle so we can get a better return on them and we don't have um, sometimes wasted cost on um, some of the nutrients. Sometimes we're overfeeding when we don't need to and underfeeding when we should be. So um, I hope everybody got a little bit out of that. Um, of that presentation. Um, I hope it was a recap on some of it, but I hope th there's some new uh, nuggets information that you're able to take home with it and be able to really incorporate with your program. Um, like I said, you know, we can hit you with a water hose. I hope this game was uh, a little bit more of a bigger picture perspective on how we feed forages and maximize our cattle. Um, not only trying to you know, put more dollars in our pocket, but trying to reduce the amount of dollars leaving our pocket. So um, let's see here. I believe that's it. So, oh, so at this time, I will take any questions that anybody may ha have. Let's see here. All right. So does anybody have any questions? All right. Well, if nobody has any questions, we'll we'll stop the recording. I will uh, post this uh, on our YouTube page, and then I will send out the link with uh, as well as the link for next uh, or for Thursday's meeting. Uh, we have two more meetings. We have one on Thursday. That's one skin back at the state level, and then we have one on the following Monday. So I'll send information about that. Uh, please, whatever you do, do not hesitate to give me a call. Uh, at any point in time, I've included my phone number on each one of the, the emails so that you can give me a call. Uh, any questions you may have, you can call about the forage analysis. Uh, it's the best return between the soil test and that, the best return you're ever going to get uh, on a dollar for dollar uh, basis. But uh, don't be afraid um, to give me a call or email me. Um, and if not, we'll see everybody later. And thank you and have a good night.